a few hundred yards in back of me, in that first dome, resides approximately a thousand times the long-lived radioactivity of the Hiroshima bomb. Behind it, in that second dome, is another thousand times the long-lived radioactivity of the Hiroshima bomb. And in the two spent fuel pools, the pools in which the radiated fuel is put after it's taken out of the reactors, there's another 10,000 times the long-lived radioactivity of Hiroshima. All told, a few hundred yards from us right now, there's about 20 uh, times as much long-lived radioactivity as was released by the Chernobyl accident 26 years ago, and greatly more than was released in the Fukushima accident. Uh, to put that in perspective for you, the amount of radioactivity uh, a few hundred yards from us, just in one of those reactors, was estimated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission 30 years ago to be capable, if it were released in an accident, of causing 130,000 immediate deaths of the sort that occurred in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, 300,000 cancers, and 600,000 genetic effects for about a million casualties were there an accident in just one of those domes in back of me. And that is before the population of Southern California got much larger and before we learned that radio radiation is even more dangerous than was assumed back in 1980. So why does that matter? It obviously matters because if there were an accident, you could lose most of Southern California. So the question is, can we have an accident? Or is that facility a few hundred yards from us, so well run that you simply have nothing to worry about? So I want to give you one particularly remarkable number. Southern California Edison is number one. It was number one last year. It was number one the previous year and it was number one the year before in safety complaints. Here are the numbers. Last year, the number of substantiated and unsubstantiated complaints was six times the national average. But they were even better the year before. 2010, they were 15 times the national average for safety complaints. They had 300 allegations of safety problems in the past four years, 33 of discrimination against workers who brought safety concerns forward, 63 substantiated allegations. And just to show you how good they are, their number of safety complaints was 118 higher than the number two plant in the country. They're not only number one, but they're number one by a large margin. So why, why does that matter? Well, let me give you a couple of examples of the safety problems that have occurred at this facility a few hundred yards from us. It was discovered a few years ago that for a period of five years, hourly fire watches, watches designed to make sure there wasn't a fire that could cause the loss of control and therefore the loss of cooling and a meltdown. For five years, the fire watches on this uh, uh, shift had not been done. And they had fabricated the log. Rather than doing the fire watches, they just wrote a note saying we did it when we didn't. Not only did that go on for five years, not only did they fabricate the logs, but Edison never discovered it never stopped it. And when it was finally discovered, do you know what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did? Nothing. Nothing. They entered into an alternative dispute resolution process with Edison. There was no dispute. They had violated the rules. And they let Edison get off without a penalty, a fine, a violation. Instead, Edison simply said that they would put in place sensitivity training program 
to increase the awareness of workers of the importance of following rules. Let me give you another example. Again, a few hundred yards behind me, for four years, the batteries for the backup diesel generators were not properly connected. Four years. And you all know from Fukushima how important it is to have backup diesel generators. When you lose off-site power, you see those power lines back here. When you lose the power coming into the reactor, it cannot run the pumps to cool the fuel to prevent it from melting and releasing its radioactivity. You need to have backup diesel generators, and that's what failed at Fukushima. But for four years, the batteries weren't connected. They've had other troubles with their backup diesel generators as well. Here's one number that really scares me. 25% of the workers at San Onofre, according to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, feel frightened to bring safety complaints forward to their management because they're worried they'll be demoted or fired if they do so. Now, we're not talking about a McDonald's hamburger joint where there may, may be a safety problem about mopping floors. We're talking about a facility that has in it, when it runs, 15 billion curies of radioactivity. To put that in perspective, we measure permissible concentrations in the environment in picocuries. That's millionths of a millionth of a curie. And when the reactors are running, there are 15 billion curies. We could lose much of California if a worker was too frightened to bring forward a safety complaint, if there were large numbers of safety problems not fixed, if for years they ran as they have in violation of the fire safety rules. For decades, San Onofre was supposed to fix the problems with the fire risks at the site. And for years, they requested extensions. They requested delays. They requested waivers. As recently as March of last year, the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, gave them another extension and another vacation, vacation from compliance with the fire safety rules. And if there were a fire that took out both their primary and their secondary wiring, they would be unable to control the reactor, unable to prevent the fuel from melting and releasing that vast quantity of radioactivity into the second most populated zone in the country within 50 miles of a reactor. There are eight and a half million people within 50 miles of where we stand. And you all know that during the Fukushima accident, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission recommended that Americans in Japan evacuate out 50 miles. Do you know how far they require an evacuation from this facility? 10 miles. But you also know that evacuation is a fiction. We all know what the freeways are like in Southern California during the best of times. I sat through the emergency planning hearings for San Onofre, and there they had this fiction that essentially every square foot of freeway would be filled with every square foot of car. There would be no overheating, no accidents, no people racing to go to try to pick up kids, to try to get potassium iodide tablets to protect their thyroids and so on. We can't evacuate Southern California in case of an accident. There's no way to be able to protect yourself except prevention. So let me tell you for a moment about the current fiasco that's occurring a few hundred yards from here. When they built that reactor, they said it had a design life eventually of 40 years. That's what its current license is for. And they said that the steam generators would last for those 40 years. Steam generators are extraordinarily important parts of a reactor. They are designed to be the primary coolant barrier. That primary coolant is the very radioactive water that cools the reactor core, the highly irradiated fuel. 
And the steam generator tubes do two things. One is they keep that highly radioactive water inside, so it doesn't get into the environment. And secondly, they prevent that coolant from being lost, because if you lose that coolant, the fuel can melt, and you can have a meltdown. So um, a couple months ago, a tube in the uh, Unit 3, the one that's closest to us, burst. And Edison said, don't worry, there was no release of radioactivity. Nothing to worry about. The following day, the nuclear regulatory said, yes, there was a release of radioactivity. And by the way, Unit 2 is having a lot of troubles too. Unit 2 had been down for maintenance, and they had discovered, as of that point, the following amazing numbers. That two of the tubes in Unit 2 had 30% of their thickness already lost, thinned. The, the, vet, the uh, steam generators, which were the replacement steam generators, had been put in only 22 months earlier, had run for only 22 months, and had already lost 30% of the thickness for two of the tubes, 20% for 69, and more than 800 of the tubes had 10 to 20% of the thickness. That is in one of the two steam generators in the Unit 3 behind me. Um, and in Unit 2, they burst the tube. Now, there, I've given you some numbers. The reason for that is I want you to get one number from Edison. And those of you who are in the press, I challenge you to extract this number from Edison. How many damaged tubes have they now found? Remember, in early February, in only one of the four steam generators, and they'd only inspected 80% of it, there were about 900 tubes already damaged. That's 12% of the tubes they had looked at. They are not permitted to run at full power with more than 7 or 8% of the tubes plugged. So this is the dog that hasn't barked. This is the number they don't want to give you. They keep focusing on how many are so severely damaged that they've had to plug them now. But if the numbers they reported in early February have continued, that reactor can't keep running for any significant period of time. If in one or two years they have lost, damaged, 12% of the tubes, starting up again and running for another year or two or three will mean that they have exceeded that plugging limit. And what worries me is that Edison, remember that record I just gave you, Number one in the country for safety complaints. Five years of fabricating firewatch laws. Four years of not having the batteries connected with the, to the backup diesel generators. A company that NRC says has a problem with its safety culture. A company that NRC says has been willfully violating safety regulations. Not just accidentally, but willfully. And a, country, a company that has created a chilling effect on its workers so that they are too frightened to bring forth safety concerns. My fear is that that company is going to push to restart one or both of those reactors, even though it is unsafe to do so. I want to read you the most amazing quotation I have read in years, and that is from an Edison official named Mr. Dietrich in a, great, a telephone interview he did with a number of reporters. And here's what he said. Here, in the next few months, there is a probability greater than 50% that we'll be able to convince ourselves of that reasonable assurance of safety that we need in order to restart the reactors. A greater than 50% chance that he'll be able to convince himself. Not a 99% chance that it's safe, not a 99.99% chance that it's safe for you, but a 50% chance he'll be able to convince himself and his company that there's a reasonable assurance they can safely restart. And that is my fear. They are losing a million bucks a day to have to purchase replacement power. They have a tremendous financial incentive to be able to get that reactor, those reactors, back online. 
and they have a completely asleep at the switch regulator that has never turned down a license in a contested reactor case that in fact permitted Edison when they put in those new steam generators a few years ago to tell NRC you don't need to do any safety review because we're replacing these old steam generators with essentially identical new ones. And then Edison, in January, published an article boasting about having gotten the NRC to agree that this was identical, and then laying out all of the significant changes they'd actually made to the steam generators. So they were able to get the NRC to not even do the review that's required by claiming it was a like-for-like -like change when, it, in fact, they made very significant changes that apparently uh, something that in the new steam generators is obviously causing them to fall apart, not in 30 years, not in 40 years, but in one year, steam generators in Unit 2 have been in place for one year, and they are falling apart. So here is the risk to Southern California that Edison, with this safety culture problem, with this history of being number one for safety problems in the country, and a regulator that is probably the most captured regulatory agency in the country, meaning captured by the industry it is to regulate, that that regulator will say, fine, and they will start up without really knowing what the problem is, without having fixed the problem, and we'll have more steam generator, generator tubes rupturing, will have the risk that that will propagate to, to other steam generator tubes. And you have all of the associated problems. If there were an earthquake, you want those steam generators to be strong. But many of those tubes are damaged already. They're weaker than they were supposed to be. If there were an earthquake, you would want to make sure that there was appropriate protection against fire. Because if the quake triggers a fire, you can't control the reactor and the reactor can melt. But for decades, they failed to comply with the fire safety rules, telling the NRC, don't worry, we'll check every hour in case there's a fire. But for five years, they didn't check. And when the NRC discovered that, the NRC said, OK. So we have an immense risk. If we were, however, not standing a few hundred yards from a dozen, excuse me, 10,000 times the long life radioactivity of Hiroshima. But if we were standing instead next to a windmill array or a photovoltaic array, or if we were getting our power from solar thermal facilities just a bit inland, none of us would be here. An earthquake couldn't cause any trouble. A terrorist couldn't cause any trouble. Um, a company that's not concerned about safety couldn't cause any great harm. Because if a photovoltaic array stops functioning, no one dies. If that place stops functioning, if the cooling stops, if the uh, control wires burn, if the diesel generators fail, if the steam generators propagate a series of bursts, we can lose much of Southern California we can lose hundreds of thousands of people. So um, this is simply not abstract. Let me end, if I may, with one story. Some of you may have heard me tell it to you before. It's a story that the late anthropologist uh, Ashley Montague used to like to tell. It was about an ape that escaped from the New York Public Zoo. They looked everywhere for it, his keepers, throughout the zoo and couldn't find it. So they eventually searched all throughout New York City and eventually found the ape in the basement of the New York Public Library <laughs> with a book in each hand, in the stacks. In one hand was the Holy Bible. In the other hand was Darwin's Origin of Species. The people from the zoo asked the ape, what are you doing here? We searched all over for you. What are you doing in the basement of the New York Public Library with a copy of the Holy Scripture and of Origin of Species. And the ape said, I'm trying to figure out if I am my brother's keeper or my keeper's brother. <laughs> that ape is a lot smarter than the rest of us. 
that ape knows that he is connected to all life and is the brother and sister um, of all. That is the lesson that we have to learn, that it is one environment and that our actions affect others. Uh, and so I urge you to be vigilant, to be diligent, to try to get our governor, who once opposed the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant but has been silent about this new threat to all of you from San Onofre, to act in concert so that we can bridge the gap, if you'll pardon the expression, between the reliance on that unsafe nuclear uh, energy in back of us to a world that relies on safe, sustainable, and clean solar energy. Thank you.